Section twenty four of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Savage. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section twenty four. Helena in Troas. Dramatic Review, May twenty second, eighteen eighty. One might have thought that to have produced As You Like It in an English forest would have satisfied the most ambitious spirit, but Mr. Godwin has not contented himself with his sylvan triumphs. From Shakespeare he has passed to Sophocles, and has given us the most perfect exhibition of a Greek dramatic performance that has as yet been seen in this country. For beautiful as were the productions of Agamemnon at Oxford, and the Eumenides at Cambridge, their effects were marred in no small or unimportant degree by the want of a proper orchestra for the chorus with its dance and song, a want that was fully supplied in Mr. Godwin's presentation by the use of the arena of a circus. In the centre of this circle, which was paved with a semblance of tessellated marble, stood the altar of Dionysius, and beyond it rose the long, shallow stage, faced with casts from the temple of Basset and bearing the huge portal of the house of Paris, and the gleaming battlements of Troy. Over the portal hung a great curtain, painted with crimson lions, which, when drawn aside, disclosed two massive gates of bronze. In front of the house was placed a golden image of Aphrodite, and across the ramparts on either hand could be seen a stretch of blue waters and faint purple hills. The scene was lovely, not merely in the harmony of its colour, but in the exquisite delicacy of its architectural proportions. No nation has ever felt the pure beauty of mere construction so strongly as the Greeks, and in this respect Mr. Godwin has fully caught the Greek feeling. The play opened by the entrance of the chorus, white-vestured and gold-filleted, under the leadership of Miss Kinnaird, whose fine gestures and rhythmic movements were quite admirable. In answer to their appeal, the stage curtain slowly divided, and from the house of Paris came forth Helen herself, in a robe woven with all the wonders of war, and broidered with the pageant of battle. With her were her two handmaidens, one in white and yellow, and one in green. Hecuba followed in sombre grey of mourning, and Priam in kingly garb of gold and purple, and Paris in Phrygian cap and light archer's dress and when at sunset the lover of Helen was borne back wounded from the field, down from the oaks of Ida stole Enone in the flowing drapery of the daughter of a river-god, every fold of her garments rippling like dim water as she moved. As regards the acting, the two things the Greek valued most in actors were grace of gesture and music of voice. Indeed, to gain these virtues their actors used to subject themselves to a regular course of gymnastics, and a particular regime of diet, health being to the Greeks not merely a quality of art, but a condition of its production. Whether or not our English actors hold the same view may be doubted. But Mr. Vezin certainly has always recognized the importance of a physical as well as of an intellectual training for the stage and his performance of King Priam was distinguished by stately dignity and most musical enunciation. With Mr. Vezin, grace of gesture is an unconscious result, not a conscious effort. It has become nature, because it was once art. Mr. Beerbohm Tree also is deserving of very high praise for his Paris. Ease and elegance characterized every movement he made, and his voice was extremely effective. Mr. Tree is the perfect Proteus of actors. He can wear the dress of any century and the appearance of any age, and has a marvellous capacity of absorbing his personality into the character he is creating. To have method without mannerism is given only to a few, but among the few is Mr. Tree. Miss Alma Murray does not possess the physique requisite for our conception of Helen, but the beauty of her movements and the extremely sympathetic quality of her voice gave an indefinable charm to her performance. Mrs. Jopling looked like a poem from the Pantheon, and, indeed, the Personae Mutae were not the least effective figures in the play. Hecuba was hardly a success. In acting, the impression of sincerity is conveyed by tone, not by mere volume of voice, and whatever influence emotion has on utterance, it is certainly not in the direction of false emphasis. Mrs. Beerbohm Tree's Enone was much better, and had some fine moments of passion, but the harsh realistic shriek with which the nymph flung herself from the battlements, however effective it might have been in a comedy of Sardou, or in one of Mr. Burnand's farces, was quite out of place in the representation of a Greek tragedy. The classical drama is an imaginative, poetic art, 
which requires the grand style for its interpretation, and produces its effects by the most ideal means. It is in the operas of Wagner, not in popular melodrama, that any approximation to the Greek method can be found. Better to wear mask and buskin than to mar by any modernity of expression the calm majesty of Melpomene. As an artistic whole, however, the performance was undoubtedly a great success. It has been much praised for its archaeology, but Mr. Godwin is something more than a mere antiquarian. He takes the facts of archaeology, but he converts them into artistic and dramatic effects, and the historical accuracy that underlies the visible shapes of beauty that he presents to us is not by any means the distinguishing quality of the complete work of art. This quality is the absolute unity and harmony of the entire presentation, the presence of one mind controlling the most minute details, and revealing itself only in that true perfection which hides personality. On more than one occasion it seemed to me that the stage was kept a little too dark, and that a purely picturesque effect of light and shade was substituted for the plastic clearness of outline that the Greeks so desired. Some objection, too, might be made to the late character of the statue of Aphrodite, which was decidedly post-Periclean. These, however, are unimportant points. The performance was not intended to be an absolute reproduction of the Greek stage of the fifth century before Christ. It was simply the presentation in Greek form of a poem conceived in the Greek spirit, and the secret of its beauty was the perfect correspondence of form and matter, the delicate equilibrium of spirit and sense. As for the play, it had, of course, to throw away many sweet, superfluous graces of expression before it could adapt itself to the conditions of theatrical presentation, but much that is good was retained, and the choruses, which really possess some pure notes of lyric loveliness, were sung in their entirety. Here and there, it is true, occur such lines as, What wilt thou do? What can the handful still left? Lines that owe their blank verse character more to the courtesy of the printer than to the genius of the poet for without rhythm and melody there is no verse at all, and the attempt to fit Greek forms of construction to our English language often gives the work the air of an awkward translation. However, there is a great deal that is pleasing in Helena and Troyus, and, on the whole, the play was worthy of its pageant, and the poem deserved the peplums. It is much to be regretted that Mr. Godwin's beautiful theatre cannot be made a permanent institution. Even looked at from the low standpoint of educational value, such a performance as that given last Monday might be of the greatest service to modern culture, and who knows but a series of these productions might civilise South Kensington and give tone to Brompton. Still it is something to have shown our artists a dream of form in days of thought, and to have allowed the Philistines to peer into paradise. And this is what Mr. Godwin has done. End of section 24. Helena in Troas.